Hello, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining the second webinar of GHIT PDP's webinar series, Session 2, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, titled Innovative Partnership for the Most Neglected. We are pleased to have you all from all over the world today. I am Erika Koyama of GHIT Fund, and I'll be the moderator of this webinar today. This webinar is sponsored by many organizations. The Japanese Alliance on Global NTDs, Japan Association of Clinical Reagent Industries, Japan Pharmaceutical Manufacturers Association, Japanese Association for Infectious Diseases, Japanese Society of Parasitology, Japanese Society of Tropical Medicine, and last but not least, uh, by Japanese Society of Vaccinology. Thank you for sponsoring this webinar. And here is the overview of today's session featuring a DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Disease, Diseases Initiative, a PDP focusing on fight against neglected topical diseases. Please allow me to give you some guidance about the webinar before we uh, start this uh, presentations from the panelists. Today's session will be conducted in English but we also have a simultaneous translation to Japanese available. If you wish to listen to the webinar in Japanese, please choose Japanese from, from the interpretation box on your right-hand corner. Please feel free to send your questions anytime during the webinar via the Q&A box at the bottom of this window. We also accept questions uh, in Japanese. If you would like to address your questions verbally, you can also choose the button to raise your hand during the Q&A session. You can find the button to raise your hand also at the bottom of your window. If you have any technical issues, please contact the email indicated here. Please also kindly note that we will be recording today's webinar and we are planning to upload it on JHIT's website after this webinar. There will also be a questionnaire at the end of this webinar so it would be very helpful if you could take two minutes of your time to answer them. We have started this webinar series to maintain the momentum and foster dialogues about the R&D community's role, challenges and opportunities in the fight against neglected diseases during and past COVID pandemic era. In our last session with MMB, Medicines for Malaria Venture, we had a brief introduction about the role of PDPs and its partnership in the fight against malaria. In this session too, with DNDI, we will focus on the importance of partnership in developing the treatment for the most neglected diseases. Now, I would like to introduce the panelists of today's webinar. Today's panelists uh, will be Dr. Byron Arana and Ms. Kauri Nakatani from DNDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, Professor Ken Ishii from the Institute of Medical Science, University of Tokyo, Ms. Tomoko Kimura, Tomomi Kimura from Gene Design, Ajinomoto Biopharma. We would like to start the first presentation with DNDI. The first presenter would be Dr. Byron Arana, followed by Ms. Kauri Nakatani. Now I would like to hand off. Uh, now I would like to hand over to, oh, sorry, Miss Nakatani first. So if Nakatani-san, if you could unmute yourself and uh, start your presentation. Thank you very much. Let me uh, share my uh, screen. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, let me uh, start my presentation. I'm so delighted to participate in this seminar uh, with our partners and talk about who we are and why we exist and how we work and how, what we would like to bring to the world. My name is Kaori Nakatani, uh, head of DNDI Japan, uh, who takes you through the journey to know DNDI and PDP, Product Development Partnership, and how GHIT makes a significant difference and brings impact in neglected diseases, research and development. So how a DNDI was born? 
Um, back in 1990s, uh, doctors of um, MSF, um, Medicine Sans Frontiers, um, uh, doctors of MSF were so frustrated to see patients uh, who didn't have um, safe medicine, uh, uh, didn't have effective and safe and affordable medicine. So in the absence of commercial incentive, an uh, alternative R&D model, research and development model, was needed to provide uh, development pathways and, and motivate the community. Product, product development partnership like DNDI have been established and delivered many new treatments, including several new chemical entities. DNDI was established in 2003. The headquarter is in, located in Geneva, Switzerland, and we have eight regional offices in Kenya, DRC, India, Brazil, South Africa, Malaysia, United States, and Japan. We have about 250 staff members. So this slide uh, provides the need for DNDI and the clear focus uh, on neglected diseases and to help patients. There is a fate to gap between available new drugs for neglected diseases and global disease burden from NTDs. Unfortunately, the reality remains as of today and we exist to change this reality. So what is PDP and how we work? Let us explore a bit more. PDP develop new products for people suffering from diseases and health threat underserved by traditional markets. This is accomplished only by building partnerships between public, private, academic, and philanthropic sectors. The public-private partnership brings together different partners. The goal of developing a product for patients provides the focus and drive for PDP. PDP becomes global leaders in developing new health technologies where lack of traditional market incentives have stalled progress. DNDI is a virtual R&D organization. We have no labs, no manufacturing facilities of our own. We act as a conductor of a virtual orchestra to coordinate the activities of our, uh, our more than 200 partners around the globe to address the need of neglected patients. Our virtual model harnesses the best of the public, private, academic, and philanthropic sectors uh, science. Um, to bring the best science um, and also drive the knowledge, uh, knowledge creation through open and collaborative approaches to the medical innovation. So what we achieved so far, we have developed uh, nine treatment in 15 years, established diverse and global clinical and research networks, mainly in lower middle income countries, uh, influenced policies on R&D and access to medicine, and formed a new organization with WHO to fight drug resistant infections called GARP. We are proud of what we have achieved so far, but this is only possible through successful partnerships. Are we still relevant? I think we are still relevant. Our work is more, than, more urgent than ever. As you know, the global response to COVID-19 pandemic is enabling major scientific advances and the development, the development of new tools at remarkable speed. But it has also thrown into sharp relief the limited commitment to prioritizing and financing research needs in resource-limited resource settings. And the lack of preparedness and globally agreed rules to ensure both transparency and equitable access to any new tools. As we face the coming years, we must respond to ever increasing needs such as future pandemics, climate sensitive diseases, and long standing epidemics and neglected diseases, all of which exact are disproportionately toll on already vulnerable and neglected communities. 
our work contributes directly to SDGs, including universal health coverage, and WHO strategies, including 20, uh, 2030 roadmap for neglected diseases. This is our strategy until 2028. DNDI maintains a commitment to deliver therapeutic solutions for disease, diseases where innovation and access to safe, simple, effective, and affordable treatment are lacking. We aim to have uh, delivered 25 new treatments in, um, in our first 25 years. We will leverage a rich portfolio of drug candidates and broad clinical networks for NTDs and viral diseases we work on. Through our R&D programs alliance in, in low and middle income countries, DNDI works closely with medical and scientific experts, government leaders, industry, academic partners, NGOs, and affected communities to define most uh, pressing R&D needs, share knowledge and expertise, um, uh, encourage medical research and development and production capacity, and accelerate access to new treatment. Our partners in low and middle income countries uh, empower our progress at every stage of our, our R&D process and increase national and regional collaboration and strengthening innovation ecosystems that put people's needs first. These are the list of diseases uh, we work on, seven diseases and COVID-19 pandemic clone diseases. We also uh, continuously assess new opportunities uh, uh, continually assess new opportunities to address patients' unmet needs, exploring feasibility and best pathways to address diseases with persistent RRD and access gaps, including the pandemic clone and climate sensitive diseases. This is our current RD portfolio. The strong R&D ecosystem in Japan and commitment to global health makes Japan and our Japanese partners critical to the success of our wide R&D portfolio. The engagement from discovery to clinical development is hugely important and the general support of the GHIT fund cannot be overstated. Although we are pleased by the progress of our uh, portfolio, we still have urgent needs for new partners and projects. For example, we are interested to find improved assay systems which are able to better characterize the actual antiparasitic drugs. We are interested to find and help to understand host parasite interactions and to identify opportunities for intervention. Also, we are interested to access to new methods to accelerate and discover improved drug candidate. Partners able to provide novel chemical libraries for screening. Today, my colleague Bailen and our partners We'll talk about CPG D35 project, cutaneous leishmaniasis, as an example from the multiple projects supported by GHIT, a close leishmania portfolio. This is the summary of uh, the history of collaboration with GHIT and uh, Japanese industry and DNDI Japan. And you can see a number of projects uh, in the past that we collaborated. And this is uh, really shows the significant impact that uh, GHIT brings. And also um, the number of Japanese partners collaborated with us. And hopefully we will grow together, uh, even uh, grow together in the future and um, bring the treatment uh, to uh, of our um, patients in need. And I'm going to uh, hand over to my colleague Byron 
to talk about uh, CPGD35 project. And also I'm looking forward to hearing the, um, the presentation from my partner and uh, I will pass my uh, mic to Byron. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaori. Um, let me now uh, share my screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate in this webinar. As uh, Kaori mentioned, I was uh, asked to, to present the efforts on CPGD35 uh, as part of the action that we are conducting for cutaneous leishmanasis. Um, so just one second. Just a, a brief introduction about leishmaniasis for those who are not uh, familiar with the disease. Leishmaniasis is endemic in 98 countries. It's a complex vector-borne disease and, three, and has three main clinical presentations. Visceral leishmaniasis affecting the liver, spleen, and the internal organs. Cutaneous leishmaniasis mainly affecting the, the, the skin. And mucocutaneous leishmaniasis affecting both the skin and the mucosas. The disease is uh, very well linked to environmental changes, including deforestation and uh, urbanization. It affects the poorest of the poorest people in, on the earth. Uh, it's prone to outbreaks. And in fact, there have been several outbreaks uh, recently reported in the context of all these conflicts that are having, uh, having in place in different parts of the world. And it's considered that there is between 0.7 to 1.4 million of new cases every year. Regarding cutaneous leishmaniasis, the disease is endemic in 88 countries, is the more in, uh, prevalent disease, uh, uh, clinical form of leishmaniasis. There are between 0.7 to 1.2 million of new cases every year, which means that there are more or less one case every 30 seconds. The Eastern Mediterranean region countries contribute to 60% of all the burden of all cases. There are several uh, vectors and reservoirs, including the life cycle. There are no vaccines, no chemoprophylaxis, and the drug we are using are very old and uh, high toxic. So current treatment recommendations are basically based on the clinical presentation of the disease and the species of leishmania causing the lesions. And those recommendations go from no treatment for those lesions very small caused by El Mayor or El Mexicana, topical treatment like uh, antimonial uh, intralesional, liquid nitrogen or thermotherapy, systemic drugs, the only oral drug is uh, currently miltefosin, and then some systemic parenteral drugs like antimonials, either sodium methylgluconate or megalumin antimonial, pentamidine, and in some cases, aphotericin B. And then we have some antimonials, uh, some combinations, sorry, that uh, basically using the antimonials in different combinations to treat the more aggressive forms. So these drugs, uh, the antimonials is probably the only drug that is widely used. It's probably 98% of all cases worldwide are treated with antimonials. And these are very toxic drugs, which requires 20 to 40 injections every, every day for, for, for 20 to 40 days, have a lot of toxicities. And, uh, is, uh, and, and the compliance for the patient is very low. So, Looking at this scenario, we really believe that there is a need to develop a new topical or oral treatments which are safer, uh, lower cost, and quite effective against all forms of cutaneous leishmaniasis and amenable to be used in the field. But cutaneous leishmaniasis leads to other problems as well. Uh, it, it basically, given the, the problem with the scarring, it takes a lot of problems with the stigma and mental health problem especially for women and children who are heavily affected in the Eastern Mediterranean region. They suffer a lot of uh, stress, uh, ostracism and, and segregation. And many of these women find problems to, 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 to marry, for example, in some of these countries. So it's not only uh, an ulcer on the skin, has a lot of problem with the, with the mental health issues. Given the, the, the spectrum, clinical spectrum of the leishmaniasis, and that in this case, following the, the, the principle that, that one size don't fit all, 
the NDI has developed its strategy focusing four different approaches. In the long term, we are aiming to, to, to develop a topical treatment for patients with a small number of lesions in size and in number, an oral drug uh, for patients who need systemic treatment, and an immunomodulator. Uh, in this particular case, the one I'm referring here is CPGD35. The reason of having an immunomodulator is because it's very well determined that the outcome of the disease is really depending on the immune response that the host has in, in front of the infection. So those uh, three approaches, uh, we realized that it will take several years to be, to, to be developed. And that's why in the short period of time, we are focusing in, in using the combination of current treatment approaches. In, in our particular case, we are focusing on testing the use of thermotherapy and miltefosin, which is both treatment uh, currently being approved by uh, WHO and FDA to be used for the treatment of cutaneous leishmaniasis alone. We are testing the combination of these two treatments. Regarding CPG, uh, it, it, this CPG D35 was patented by the, the USA government and licensed to BNDI for continuing its uh, clinical development. Dr. Bertelli, Dr. Kliman, and Professor Ken Nishi here in, in this webinar are named as inventors of the PAT and of this CPG D35. It is a class eight uh, TLR9 agonist. It's basically designed to deactivate the immune system to enhance the mechanism effector of uncutaneous and Leishman acid infection. It has been widely tested in animal models uh, for infections against uh, Leishmania mayor and Amazonensis with very encouraging results, even showing that the, the lesions kill in the monkey model uh, without any addition of, uh, the, of uh, antiparasitic drugs. Uh, with the support from GHIT and with in collaboration with the Tokyo University and Gene Design, we have been able to complete all the preclinical uh, uh, studies and we are now conducting the first in human studies in UK. So we are basically right now developing the single ascending dose, which we expect to complete by the end of 2021. CPG, as uh, is in immunomodulator only, we, we are planning to use it in combination with some of the new chemical entities, oral drugs that we are developing in, as part of the effort, global effort on the end of DNDI on leishmaniasis. So it has been really a very long journey for this CPG, as, as uh, you can see here in this, uh, in this uh, table and this screen. Um, the, it was patented in 1999, it was selected by the NDI for, pre, for its uh, clinical, preclinical development in 2014 and 15. And then uh, in the following three stages from the preclinical efic efficacy, the preclinical development and early clinical development, we have been enjoying of the benefit of being supported by GHIT and at the same time enjoying the collaboration from our Japanese partners to develop this product. We expect that in the following years, as we advance with the clinical development, we will reach phase two, phase three, and hopefully registration of this CPG as an enhancer of the immune system for, uh, to help in the fight against cutaneous leishmaniasis. And this is, as the Kaori mentioned, this is not only this is not only DNDI or few partners, it's in fact a global collaboration, including all the partners in, uh, listed in, in, this, in this slide, showing that they have worked side by side with us in at different stages of the development of this CPG. There are several partners and for sure in the following years, others will add in this, in this slide. But uh, during these last two years, I think we have been facing problems with the COVID, as you all perfectly know, COVID has impacted our lives in many different ways. And of course, uh, it has impacted also the development of our project. The lockdown and the stay-home orders by the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021 20, uh, caused a drop of the number of participants and forcing the CROs to postpone the initiation of few studies, of new studies. Many CROs were also involved in, in other projects related with uh, vaccine uh, COVID-19 vaccines, and they were not accepting new projects. Uh, we were forced to include an, an exclusion criteria for those patients who have received, or we are planning to receive a COVID-19 vaccine in the short period of time. And of course, this is 
somehow worsen it because no people are giving the, the misinformation with the COVID-19 vaccine. Some people fear that uh, this uh, immunomodulator, because it's acting in the immune system, has also kind of potential bad effects on the immune system when combined with uh, other drugs. But on the positive side, I would say that we have been able during all these years of uh, working with our Japanese partners to learn very good lessons. Uh, we know that GHIT, of course, has created a special environment with Japanese pharmaceutical companies and international organizations creating medicines and vaccines against diseases for which there, there is a lack of R&D funding, which is much very nice with, the, with the, our, our mission and mission in DNDI. The Japanese pharmacies companies also brings a lot of expertise and different capabilities in different areas. And this is also that we have learned working side by side with gene design. CPG oligonucleotides are not easy to, to, to develop, uh, it requires a, a very sophisticated expertise and enjoying the benefit of working side by side with Ken Ishii, who is the, one of the experts and the inventors of this CPG and gene design who is specialized in, in manufacturing oligos is a, is a plus. Finally, uh, this is in the, in the very personal positive side, let's say, uh, working in the international environment always brings some challenges and uh, with our Japanese uh, partners and with me speaking Spanish as my first tongue language, always there are some issues of related to communication, culture, time zones, and uh, other issues. But the politeness, diplomacy, and Japanese gastronomy compensates in abundance any of these challenges. So thank you very much. I think I have taken a few seconds more than <laughs> the time I was allowed. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Nakatani and Dr. Arana for your brief presentation about DNDI, starting with the DNDI strategic plan and achievement together with your partners, as well as an introduction to leishmaniasis and your long journey to a fight against leishmaniasis um, with CPGD 35. It was uh, very uh, good to understand. Thank you so much again for your presentations. And um, for to the audience, um, please feel free to use the Q&A box to address any questions uh, throughout this webinar. So next, I would like to introduce our next speaker, who would be the Professor Ken Ishii from the Institute of Medical Science, the University of Tokyo. Ishii Sensei, I think your camera is on and uh, you're uh, also unmuted. So if you could start uh, sharing your screen and start your presentation, that would be great. Thank you for introduction of myself. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Kenishi from University of Tokyo, and I'd like to uh, share my experience with the uh, uh, GHIT and DNDI, especially, um, uh, you know, I would like to try to share uh, how it went uh, through uh, this uh, long term, long time journey that Byron just introduced. And I would like to just show here that essential uh, people who was for, for this project, uh, Daniela Beriteri, who went on uh, going to produce a, a, a scientific body of P35 towards the clinical trial for the leishmaniasis. And then uh, myself and uh, Isang Gusel, Myra Gusel, uh, worked on that. And also now, Ms. Protagesta Jibar Chuban, was the time, at the time, it was 20, almost 20 some years ago, uh, started to work on this T35. And without this uh, uh, names with the, uh, you know, done, uh, product, uh, produced or done in the US for FDA. Uh, together with WHO, and later on, of, co of course, with the GHIT and the NDI, uh, was uh, the essential uh, part of the, uh, this project. And uh, without gene design, uh, we couldn't have had this uh, uh, product itself. And to, oops, um, I hope I can move slides. Yes. 
So uh, let me be uh, in the scientific part of this uh, CPG DNA P35. What is the CPG DNA? Uh, it is a general term of you know, stimulant tree DNA contain a methylated CPG nucleotides with a certain blanking sequence called CPG motif. And it was found because bacterial DNA contains this CPG motif 24 more than vertebral or mammalian DNA due to the CPG methylation or CPG suppressing mammalian DNA. Oligonucleotides containing the CPG motif called CPG ODN limit the activity of bacterial DNA. This is how it is found. What is the CPG motifs? So uh, imagine that you have a small, short, single strand DNA that contains only six uh, nucleotide sequence, purine, purine, CZ, pyrimidine, pyrimidine. This was the best activator for the mouse. So if you have an ASCGTT, you have a very strong in inflammatory response to the mouse cells, uh, like LPS. But if you flip the CZ to GC, you have nothing as an immunosymmetry effect. But if you have a GACGTC, which complies to the uh, rules, you still have a big, very strong immunosymmetry effect. But once this by portion of cytosine is methylated, this activity is gone. And of course, if you, if you don't follow the Franklin sequence uh, uh, rules, you don't get anything. So with this simple rule, we found that this small immuno, uh, uh, fragment of DNA is very potent drug. Of course, molecular basis of TLR. Uh, so this was found as a TLR9 ligand. So the TLR and ligand interaction, the TLR9 contains the, this uh, dimer. So TLR with the CPZ motif, as if it binds and then conformation changes cause the activation signal. So that is kind of a molecular mechanism that how uh, DNA can activate the immune system through this TLR9 like receptor 9. That time, long right? long time, long time ago in late 90s in FDA, we, we enjoyed uh, fully this mouse uh, study because when you inject the CPZ order into mouse, virtually you can protect mice from anything, including pathogen or tumor, or, or even the switching this allergic response to the good response to it, towards type one immune response. Or if you mix with that with the vaccine. It brings to a lot of nice uh, cellular response or including interferon, CTL, or uh, IgG2, which is the uh, immune response, uh, you know, identical ideal for the viral infections or intracellular uh, pathogens. So surprise came up with this data that CPZ itself, if you inject this 50 microbiome, which is quite amount to the mouse, and if, if you wait three days and come up with this thousand LD50, thousand lethal dose of Listerias or malaria or Ebola, they are, you know, okay with this lethal uh, um, microbes. Although it wasn't all micro because extracellular bacteria like a pseudomonas, uh, it didn't work at all. So with this, uh, we found that TLR activation through this uh, CZ, CPZ nucleotides can activate a variety of immune cells like dendritic cells or macrophage or B cells, all together with this multiple cascade or, or uh, you know, players of the immune system to combat pathogen or cancer has been uh, you know, uh, you know, fully uh, studied. Meanwhile, we realized that the CPZ oligonucleotide can protect not only the mouse, but also chicken or rhesus macaque, especially a leash mania major uh, by, done by Daniela Bertelli, and that it is actually very protective in monkey. However, optimal CPZ for mouse were not active in human immune system at all. It is due to the low efficient efficacy of DNA uh, for example, a vaccine was observed in current in human clinical trial due to the CPZ motif is different, and TR9 expression in cells is also different in human and mouse. So we need to have the humanized CPZ motif. With thousands of oligonucleotides we screened with Daniela, uh, we found that compared to mouse CPZ oligonucleotide uh, CPZ, with CPZ motif like this, 
K-time polygonucleotides, so D-time polygonucleotides with K as a, a TCZT or TCZA as a smooth optimal sequence, D-time CPZ or the end with the ATCZAT, which is a palindromic sequence with polygetail found to be the optimal activator of human immune cells. So how does it look like? K looks like this and D looks like this. I wouldn't go into the detail, but the um, D type oligo was very unique with this uh, polygetail and analogy head with palindromic sequence, making it a beautiful uh, hammerhead structure. So, with this kind of structure, what happened to this uh, human immune system, especially in the PBMC data, you see a KODN is a beautiful activator of B cell to proliferate B cells uh, in producing IgM IL6 while D34 oligonucleotides was very weak uh, activator for B cell, but rather strong uh, activator for PDC and NK cells. So with this humanizing variation of CPG DNA, and uh, this a distinct type of CPG found, was found. And uh, initially in early 2000, when I came back to Japan, we were very easy really going to make this K-type CPZ oligonucleotide because this was a very common way to make this phosphorylated oligonucleotide as an um, antisense. So we could make it, of course, with the uh, uh, beautiful and uh, big help from the uh, gene design. And of course, this is one of the actually uh, uh, asset of, of the GHIT, the BKC36, run by uh, Professor Holly. Uh, in an Osaka University was used, uh, this keta polygonucleotides was used as an um, adjuvant for the malaria vaccine now. It's in, uh, with the help of uh, MFG hit in EDI, it's in a phase two clinical trial in Burkina Faso. So this KCP type of CP is in available to clinical trial. So used now in many different type of the, uh, clinical applications. But, this D-type polygonucleotide has been ignored uh, for 20, almost 20 years because polyzetail actually hamper to make a, a nice GMP lot with a solo, as a soluble uh, fraction of uh, sol soluble API, which was very difficult. That, but uh, with this G, uh, GHIT uh, pro project, uh, Gene design and DNA became uh, uh, made a su big success of this making a D-type oligonucleotide as a GMP product. So with this uh, D35, the, uh, Daniela uh, went on going to show this nucleic acid-based immunomodulated D35 for treatment of Leishmaniasis. As you all may know, this experience in the urine uh, model of Leishmaniasis has been very famous. And then CPG, CPG always works well to even uh, pro, uh, you know, reduce the uh, lesion of the cutaneous leishmania in an established model in the mouse, uh, like this. But however, like I, as I showed, mouse is different from human. So the mouse uh, CPG didn't work for human. What about monkey? So Daniela went on using this humanized CPG oligonucleotides to the monkey. And with this 0.5 milligram per kilogram uh, in, injected one day one, day two, day three, seven to this uh, 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 five macaques per group, you see D35 works beautifully to produce in type one interferon, which is interferon alpha, type two interferon, which is interferon gamma, even up to 20, 12 days. So it is working on monkey, hopefully working for human. And then the beauty of this innate immune response induced by D35 was because with this uh, uh, heat map of gene expression after D35 injection was very similar to what was happening after Leishmania infection. So this immune response induced by Leishmania uh, by D35 was very similar to immune response induced by Leishmania and suggesting that, suggesting that D35 can train immune system to uh, fight against this many. So with this uh, very strong data, the K-type polyglotides, which is activated of B cell, didn't work out for established uh, you know, this, uh, model of uh, cutaneous this many monkey, at, like you see here, but the D35 is yellow. You see in this lesion, only just only two times injection was very small. 
but this was uh, experiment done a long time ago, this experiment B35 product. But Gene Design was very successful making this uh, large scale of B35 with this clinical grade of B35. Daniela made a very good success uh, with the antimonial together uh, uh, combination of D35. It was very successful to control this uh, clinical um, uh, the uh, local uh, lesion in sizes. So that gave us hope that the D35 may well work on controlling this uh, uh, rich in the, uh, skin. So with this uh, hope, uh, uh, it was uh, accepted in the GHIT with BNDI together with the, uh, ourselves in New Tokyo and uh, USFDA and NG Design, is, which is now under Ajinomoto Biopharma for the clinical phase one clinical trial. Expectation based on the clinical data is that combining D35 with the chemotherapy for treatment patient with cutanic which many will speed the lesion of the epithelizations and minimize scarring and then reduce rate of relapse and hopefully reduce the risk of developing drug resistance. Our proposal approach is clearly different shape from the current treatment recommendation of CL develop novel D-class CPZ and to promote the immune response required for the control of Lichman infection in the, in the combination with the chemotherapy will provide a major step for over existing monotherapies or combination therapy targeting the parasite only. The conventional chemotherapy uh, kill most of the Lichman parasite. The D35 especially can promote host immune response in the host the immune system even uh, further can limit or remove any remaining parasite even after the treatment. This is the uh, hope, and I hope, I hope this hope will be in a reality soon after the uh, you know, uh, clinical trial uh, uh, proceeds. So I'd like to uh, thank again Ms. Daniela Berkeley who led this uh, project at FDA for 20 some years. Uh, with, uh, with the Dennis and uh, his son and other colleagues, uh, his son Midas are making an uh, anti COVID vaccine in Turkey. Rumichiko Takista making the, the only mRNA vaccine in Japan uh, towards phase two, three years. And then Javan and I are in the uh, University of uh, Tokyo uh, working on this uh, uh, immunology and developing the vaccine and immunotherapy against it. So, and uh, finally, I'd like to thank. Byron and Steve and Daniele, actually, uh, this is, is simply a relation uh, between human. Uh, uh, Byron and Steve is make, uh, eating the takoyaki in Osaka. Uh, Steve told me that this was far better than any fancy restaurant. So that with this uh, taste, uh, uh, we can continue uh, mutual collaboration. Uh, we don't need money, we don't need uh, any uh, power, but what we need is a friendship to go on on this good project. And I'd like to thank my uh, team members. Ichigo Ichie is a Japanese word, live every day as though it were last. So let's uh, hope that we can make a drug to uh, treat and help for the people of this many. Thank you. Thank you, Ishii Sensei, for your very kind presentation about your work and findings on CPG D35, as well as your collaboration with DNDI, Gene Design, and all the other partners that who have been involved in, uh, within your project uh, to, for a potential cure for leishmaniasis. Thank you so much again for your kind presentation. And uh, thank you for submitting some questions already. Uh, we are still accepting questions via the Q&A box. And I see some of you uh, raising the hand already, but uh, we will be taking questions only during the Q&A session. So uh, if it would be great if you could wait until the Q&A session for now. So next, I would like to introduce Ms. Tomomi Kimura from Gene Design, Ajinomoto Biopharma. And uh, thank you, Kimura-san, for um, joining us. And uh, your camera is nicely on. So if you could uh, share your screen and start with your presentation, that would be great. 
Thank you for introduce. Let's start it. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present our Oregon oh. prototype manufacturing. Oh. Oh. Ah, sorry, I think we, uh, yours, we see your screen uh, on your presentation more. Oh, sorry. The... What do I say? Um, I think if you could oh. um, unshare. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah. That's better, thank you. Bye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to present Oregon Nucleotide manufacturing activity here today. Uh, actually, we have integrated the Ajinomoto group uh, and our logo uh, has changed in 20, uh, 2019. My name is Tomomi Kimura from Ajinomoto Biopharma Services, Osaka. I'm responsible for sales and technical support. To begin, I'd like to start with who we are and our gener general manufacturing method for Oregon Nucleotides. Then I will cover what we have accomplished so far and talk about further works for commercial manufacturing. First, I would like to share our policy and missions. Ajinomoto Group's mission is to contribute to the world food supply and wellness. To realize this, we have po positioned a common philosophy with, within Ajinomoto Group named Ajinomoto Shared Value or ASV. This is ASV cycle, which reinvents the economic value created to resolving social issues through the group's business activities in future business activities, which in turn contribute to the further resolution of social issues. In this way, the ongo ongoing implementation of the ASB cycle, the group will enhance corporate value by accumulating value into the corporate brand. We having the sense of ASB Clearly emphasized with the NDI to discover, develop, and deliver new medical treatments for neglect patients around the world. That's why we have been working together. Now that you understand our vision, let me talk about our services. As you hit as introduced, we are Ajinomoto Biopharma Service Group, which is a CDMO group. Our services are here and include things like small and large molecular manufacturing, ADC, with finish, peptide, and oligon manufacturing. Through these services, we can also provide developed development and analytical services as well. As in motor biopharma services are offered all over the world, small molecular manufacturing is located in Belgium and India. Large molecular manufacturing, man, manufacturing and field finish are located in US, in San Diego. And in Japan, we offer peptide and oligonucleotide synthesis. Our oligo CDMO service is our unique characteristic, which is displayed here. We can provide small scale to large scale manufacturing of oligonucleotide meaning that we can offer screening use and also clinical use active pharmaceutical ingredient or API, depending on the development stage. And the customer can choose the either solid phase, liquid, uh, sorry, solid phase or liquid phase synthesis known as edge phase if they want. Next, I'll give a brief technical overview of how oligo nucleotides are generally manufactured. The man manufacturing of oligo nucleotides needs a lot of steps. General process involves synthesis, probage and deprotection, purification, resulting and dehydrization. In the synthesis step, we start with 
uh, with one base elongation from the three prime end. Once elongation is completed, cleavage from solid phase support and the protection of the base part protecting group. Then there is purification step and resulting finally lifelization. This picture is of an oligon clarified after lipidization. Our manufacturing team usually says it is like cotton candy. Don't you think so? I think these words may not be familiar to you. However, I want to provide this overview to demonstrate that oligon nucleotide manufacturing is a complicated process. Now that you understand the overview of our oligon nucleotide manufacturing, let me talk about our works with the NDI. This is our manufacturing building. Following that, I will talk about our accomplishment and further works with the NDI. At first, Dr. Ishii introduced us to the NDI, and after that, our partnership began in 2012. We have so far successfully completed stage one and stage two. During stage one and stage two, we have accomplished multiple trial of GMP production. However, for the commercial stage, further development works are still required. As I said previously, as I said previously, oligo nucleotide manufacturing is complicated. It needs some adjust on each steps, depending on length and structure. In stage one, we optimize manufacturing flow for these 35 seekers through experimentation and adjustment of conditions for each manufacturing steps, such as synthesis, the protection, and purification. The first of GMP production of oligon at the hundreds of gram scale was successfully completed using the developed manufacturing flow. In addition, the, um, regarding analysis, we also need to optimize each sequence for each stage of manufacturing. Some of analytical methods have also been developed. Therefore, we have been able to confirm purity and also identify impurities. Furthermore, we have validated methods as well. During these projects, the ID and added team has a progress meeting regularly and gave status updates to each other. As for the second stage, we use it, used a bigger synthesizer while looking ahead to manufacturing oligon nucleotide at the kilogram scale in the future. While success, successfully scaling up, we have also achieved higher purity, which we weren't able to accomplish at the stage one. Moreover, the turnaround time has been reduced by one third through adjusting the purification condition. From these results, the yield was met and all manufacturing time was shortened. Basically, we can say that productivity increased with the current stage two process, several kilograms per year of API can now be produced. Our next goal is stage three. Even though we have successfully completed to stage one and stage two, there are still a few gaps between the current status and the future of commercial manufacturing. Working toward commercial production, we still need to improve both manufacturing and analysis. In terms of manufacturing, the manufacturing process needs to be more productive and also the robust. As far as analysis, analytical methods need change, changes in certain test items, and then the method must be validated. 
Additionally, we support the CMO part, C, sorry, CMC part of new drug approval application with DNDI. Of course, DNDI and our team are working together while discussing how best approach the solutions. In summary, since although our capability for GMP was smaller at first, we have grown over the course of DNDI this project. We are planning and working on these steps to have a successful launch. We are confident that we can be in position to enhance our supply over 10 kilograms of API in a stable manner in the near future. We at Ajizumoto Biopharma Services are the right to work continuously with DNDI and we'd like to continue to con contribute to the world awareness. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Kimura, for your presentation about the CDMO service and the manufacturing process of um, oligonucleotide that Gene Design Ajinomoto Biopharma Services provides, and also your role and collaboration with DNDI and Ishii Sensei on the CPGD certified. Thank you so much again for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So now we would like to move on to the panel discussion. So if uh, all the panelists could turn on your phone. Okay, now we see all your faces. Thank you. And uh, we would then like to start with a panel discussion, um, starting for, with the question um, to DNDI. And uh, we would also um, like to have uh, Kei Katsuno from GHIT Fund also participating in this panel discussion. Um, for, um, thank you, Katsuno san, also showing your face. Okay, first I'd like to address uh, the question to DNDI Nakatani san. So, what are the high priorities for DNDI uh, Japan or headquarters to achieve DNDI's next strategic plan and to save the most neglected patients? And what could be the GHIT roles to play? Nakatani-san, if you could unmute and... Um... Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, thanks to the support of the GHIT Fund over the past several years, we are, you know, most of the disease areas that we work on in, in have progressed from the early research to the clinical development phase, and we really appreciate for that. For us now, it's for crucial for DNDI to successfully progress these compounds through clinical trials and deliver them to neglected patients. Uh, we will need support of GHIT and other partners to fund this and success in, to succeed in that goal. That's actually um, the priority for us. Thank you. Uh, Bailon, would you like to add? No, I think uh, the GHIT support is crucial in all this, uh, in this process. And uh, we can see in the particular case of uh, CPG, how we are moving from, let's say, the left side of the spectrum of the clinical development of a drug to the right side. And so, so we hope that uh, in this process of achieving the, the, the milestone of going to, to registration, GHIT will be hopefully accompanying us in all this process, which is now when we, when we look at the timeline, uh, it's relatively short as compared that we have already uh, done. Thank you. Thank you, Nakatani-san and Byron uh, for your answers. Maybe um, Katsuno-san, um, do we have any anything to add uh, from the GHIT perspective? Um, sure. Um, thank you, Nakatani-san and Byron for, uh, for explaining your strategic planning in the up up upcoming years of the DNDI. Um, perhaps uh, briefly from GHIT's perspective, I just wanted to um, highlight the uh, the results so far. So uh, since its inception uh, in 2013, so over the past uh, roughly 80 years, um, we have invested in more than 100 projects, uh, starting from early discovery type of projects up until late clinical trial type of projects. And um, as a matter of fact, the, um, a lot of projects are actually based on the partnerships between uh, PDP type of entities like DNDI and other collaboration partners um, you know, uh, illustrated by Nakatani-san's slide earlier. 
Um, so I just wanted to underscore the importance or maybe criticality of our collaborative, continued collaborative effort uh, between GH and DNDI, and especially along with many other collaboration partners such as uh, Ishii Sensei from the University of Tokyo and Kimura-san from Gene Design and many other um, collaboration partners that are present uh, today. So I just wanted to comment on that. And last but not least, I really like the, um, the takoyaki spirit by Ishii Sensei, uh, between Ishii Sensei and Byron and Steve. So I think it's one uh, exempl exemplification of, uh, of partnership or collaboration across borders or maybe over a uh, country. So just wanted to comment on that point. So back to you, Erica. Thank you, Katsuno-san, for your comment. And yes, uh, I think uh, not now, but uh, we would really love to have takoyaki together uh, at some point when the pandemic um, exactly. is over. Yes, thank you. Yes, I was envying that photo as well, actually. <laughs> OK, and uh, now I'd like to move on to our next question. Uh, so the next question would be for Professor Aishi. So she says, say, uh, you have been engaged in the R&D programs of many organizations, but could you tell us why international or global partnerships with PDPs such as DNDI matter to fight against neglected diseases or other emerging infectious diseases? She says, if you could uh, answer that question, that would be great. Sure. Um, the first of all, the, most of the neglected disease in the tropical area so that it is essential to have partner as an academia scientist with the clinicians and the scientists in that endemic area first. And second, as uh, Byron uh, and then uh, Kaori uh, suggest that we need, of course, a uh, budget uh, to start clinical uh, development on some uh, certain drugs, but we must have uh, product development or product producers to start with and to connect that uh, between this, uh, you know, academia, you know, in the diverse area of uh, the globe towards this, uh, you know, concentrate, uh, focused uh, product development is very difficult. So in this case, GFIT or other global funds are is, is, is doing so good to connect these uh, people who will never get connected unless uh, you know there's a funding opportunity and then collaboration opportunity in the uh, meeting or some uh, place like this place uh, you know to 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 get to know each other uh, and then of course uh, um, on top of it uh, uh, human being is the uh, key that and not only that I like the uh, uh, DNDI, you know, focusing on the neglected uh, disease, but also they are trying to make it in, uh, available to uh, uh, the people who need this in a cheaper price or cheapest price. And to do this, you need actually innovative in mind and thinking. And then that, for that uh, purpose, uh, I mean, you know, only one group in the local area would not be able to create anything like this. So that we need help from the world. And I, I learned that we have an opportunity to get help. So that I want to give this, uh, uh, you know, feeling to the, anyone in the world listening to this, that, you know, if you want to do this, you can do it. That's my message. Thank you, Chi Sensei, uh, for your comment and the uh, importance of partnership. And that, that was, uh, I think that was a very strong message to, uh, to, to all the audiences today. Thank you again. And uh, my next question will be to Kimura-san from Gene Design. So um, you have kind of explained about uh, your collaboration work on the CPGD 35 with DNDI and Ishii Sensei. Um, but uh, if you could maybe share us uh, some of the maybe challenges, if you had any or any lessons learned um, during this collaboration with the NDI and um, Ishii Sensei, that would be great to hear. Hi, sorry, I'm going to say it in Japanese. I'm going to say it in Japanese. I'm going to say it in Japanese. 
お客様の案件は一つ一つ大事なものですので、えー、のーこの PBP だからこのように扱ってどうであったというところは特に分け隔てなくどれも大事な案件としてあの重要に扱ってまいりましたただですねパートナーとしてあのミーティングに参加させていただいたりした際にあの患者様がどのくらいいてなどこのお薬の,あのディベロップメントの進捗を共有いただけますことが多いためにあの非常にあの患者さん我々が作るあの拡散は DNDI 様その先に患者様がいるというところが非常にあのお示しいただけますのであの非常にモチベーションが上がる業務としてあの我々あのあの。あの扱って扱ってじゃないですね。我々はい感じてあの一緒にお仕事させていただいております。Thank you, Kimura san,、uh, for your explanation. So yes, it would be a little bit different,、uh, different in in sense that you as a CDMO,、uh, you're working of course as part of the partners、uh, partnership in this、uh, CPGD certified work, and、uh, you are not treating、um, any of your Customers or clients differently from anyone else. So, you have been、um, in a good relationship、uh, with、uh, also these PDPs. And、um, I think it was a great point that you mentioned that and it was、uh, a very、um, important for, for you to hear about the progress of, your, of the project and、um, how it's been developed and also how they, the patients is, are going to be safe or cured. Uh, with what you're actually doing right now. So, that、uh, really helped your motivation、uh, to、um, be participating in the project. So, thank you for sharing that.、Uh, so, my next question is so, we cannot really avoid、uh, asking this question about the COVID impact to your project. And、um, I would like to ask uh, Byron uh, from DNDI.、Um, I would like address this question to Byron from DNDI. So, what was the impact of COVID 19 to your work? And I think you have、uh, mentioned already in your presentation as well, but、uh, also to combat against NTDs. How can you elaborate the importance of、uh, the neglected diseases during and post pandemic? Well,、um, yes,、uh, I have already mentioned some, some uh, points that uh, you said.、Uh, For us, in particular, for the CPG, it was very timing because the, the, when we were ready to, to, to initiate the single ascending dose studies, it coincided with the highest peak of cases in the UK, which was the, the country that we selected to conduct this study. So, and, and at the same time, several of the CROs who have the expertise to conduct this kind of studies、uh, were busy doing the COVID vaccine uh, uh, clinical trials as well. And、uh, on top of that,、uh, once the, the number of patients came down, a strict the lockdown and the mobilization restrictions、uh, were in place. So, not many patients who really could travel from their places to, to, to be in, the, in these facilities for, for the treatment. And、uh, after all this、uh, has passed, and now that is,、uh, let's say, more or less in control, quote unquote,、uh, we are seeing other, other issues like.、Uh, The, the fact that、uh, we don't want to, to, to mess the immune system of the host with the COVID vaccine and our, and our API, our CPG. So we need to, we have to implement、uh, we, and we put in place some、um, uh, exclusion criteria for patients who have received recently the, the COVID vaccine or are planning to receive in the following, in the, in the, in the short period of time after participating in the study. And last but not least, I will say that、uh, unfortunately, all this misinformation about the potential side effects of the,、uh, of the COVID vaccine uh, uh, has also impacted our, our, our study because when, we, when the potential participant a p p r o a c h us or a p p r o a c h the CRO, of course, as part of the consent form, they have to explain that this product interacts with the immune system and,、uh, and that they have also. Potential side effects. And, this, and they mix both、uh, information, the misinformation from the COVID vaccine and the fact that our product is an injectable and also targeting the, the immune system. So that also has created some 
kind of fear on, on the on the on the population. Um, for the future, I, I hope that we can, uh, uh, as we advance, uh, we, we we can demonstrate that uh, the product is safe and also the this misinformation related to the COVID vaccine hopefully still start fading out. Um, but uh, in general, I will say that uh, uh, we, we can see how all these efforts on developing drugs or uh, a treatment for uh, neglected diseases here kind of shifting to targeting all these uh, new uh, threatens like the, the pandemics like COVID. So that's also another kind of problem, but not uh, specifically related to your question. Thank you, Byron, for your explanation and uh, the impact, especially uh, in the clinical trials uh, as well. So maybe, um, Ishi Sensei, do you have anything to add um, to the to, to my question, the impact of COVID-19 to your work and, and R&D work? Um, yes, uh, it was a really hectic time uh, during COVID-19 era, uh, especially Byron was suffering from this initiating clinical trial in London, as you heard, and uh, we are trying to help even, uh, you know, moving this clinical trial to uh, uh, talk in Japan, although we didn't, we don't know which one, which city will be in, you know, in the real heavier uh, endemic for the COVID-19. So it turned out to be better uh, to stick to the original plan. However, um, clinical trial cannot be stopped by any reason. So that the, not only the enrolling the people, uh, but also this you know, continuation is the key. So that it is very difficult to do this in the, during COVID era, and also you know, having uh, access to the patient in the right timing, in the right place uh, is the key. So for this, uh, you need a, a global view uh, uh, you know, to pro provide uh, uh, nice environment uh, towards the clinical trial or clinical development uh, that no uh, local academician uh, have uh, you know, strong or ideal idea. So with this uh, PDP and uh, help with the, um, the GHIT as a global um, fund and PDP was very helpful. Thank you, Ishii Sensei, uh, from, your, uh, per, per, from your point of view for the uh, impact of COVID-19 to your work. So I would like to address my uh, final question uh, to Nakatani-san of DNDI. So DNDI already has a local office in Japan, uh, but do you still have challenges maybe to access the Japanese industry? And uh, what is your plan to have further engagement with the Japanese industry? Thank you for the question. Uh, we have, I think, uh, had contact with most major Japanese pharma uh, companies to some extent already. Uh, but for us, the main challenges we have, we face is really that uh, they have all have limited um, resources to commit to their non-core areas such as NTDs. And uh, for the companies that we work, uh, do work with us in Leishmania, Chagas, and also other disease area in a portfolio, um, um, we can um, find uh, partners in, to work in early stage of uh, screening up to weed optimization, but uh, fewer partners able to commit to the preclinical development and access stages. And we are really understand that, uh, uh, of course, late stage development and access are more resource uh, intensive, we uh, understand, but also uh, for us it's most important, closer to our goal to deliver the new treatment. That is um, uh, one of the challenges, uh, but we of course greatly appreciate that the partners that we do club with us in these areas. So we will continue to uh, look for uh, more partners and opportunities uh, to work together on this area, that's one point. And for the academia uh, partners, we have close ties with the very small uh, community of Japanese researchers engaged in the NTD's research. We, again, we look forward to continuing to work with them on basic research, but uh, beyond our current partners, we would like to continue 
our um, uh, 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 journey to look for the partners from the academia. Thank you. Thank you, Nakatani-san, for your explanation. And uh, you are still journey, journeying on to find some other partners as well. Thank you so much. So thank you again uh, for participating to this webinar. And um, that was my last question for the panel discussion. So I would like to move on to the Q&A session. Thank you again for submitting uh, the questions uh, via the Q&A. And uh, you're welcome to still submit any questions you may have. And um, in the Q&A session, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Hironobu Itabashi from the GHIT Fund to moderate the Q&A session. So Itabashi-san, if you could uh, read out any questions uh, that we received, that would, be, that would be great. Thank you very much, Koyama-san, and so the speakers again for joining the call and to the participants as well. So first of all, let me start uh, with the questions that we have. Um, who, uh, those who raised their hand uh, on the Zoom. So we have, uh, I can see Imad uh, from, who has raised uh, your hand. So could you please unmute yourself and ask the question and please uh, state uh, again your name and your organization. And it will be great if you could uh, keep it short, uh, perhaps one question so that we could have more questions from the audience as well. So Imad, uh, I think if you could unmute yourself. Um, okay, uh, it seems like you have not um, unmute yourself, but in the meantime, um, I think we could move on to the other questions while you try to um, unmute yourself. So let me uh, continue with some of the questions that you uh, we have received. So uh, this one, this question is actually for uh, DNDI, um, um, either uh, Byron or Nakatani-san. So let me uh, uh, read out the question. So is your discovery and development based on an open access? And can you explain how do you address intellectual property? And are your agreements with pharmaceutical uh, companies on exclusive or not exclusive basis? So perhaps we could start with Nakatani-san. Yeah. I will uh, try to answer the question. Uh, so we are committed to open uh, sharing of our result with our wider MTD community and beyond. Uh, because for us, its goal is to provide, get the best drugs to patients in need, uh, whatever the source of the drug. But again, we also understand, having said that, we also understand that many pharma companies are sensitive to IP issues. We do understand. And we they may wish to, um, uh, protect their IP uh, in certain areas. Uh, so we are happy to work with them uh, to find solutions that, uh, that protect their IP as long as we have free access to, to provide drugs to the patients. So we also, we, uh, with a partner we discuss and uh, in case by case by case, we will find solutions for uh, mutually agreed uh, solutions. So uh, there's no one fix uh, rules. Okay, we have a big guideline, but uh, we will negotiate every time with the partners. So uh, we uh, we are. Do, I just wanted to stress that uh, we understand the uh, the standpoint of the firm as, as well, and we try to find um, mutually uh, agreed uh, standpoint on these issues. Uh, so we're happy to uh, discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nakatani-san. Uh, perhaps, Byron, if you have any additional comments on that? Uh, not in particular. As, uh, as uh, Kaori mentioned, we have our policies of open access and we have uh, uh, other policies in place, uh, making trying to make sure that uh, whatever product uh, reach the registration is open to everybody and can be accessed to everybody. Um, but this is uh, based on base-to-base -base cases, as, as uh, Kaori mentioned, because one size doesn't fit all in this particular case. But the ultimate goal is, is, is in fact, to ensure that any product developed by DNDI can reach the most neglected people. Thank you very much, uh, Byron, for your um, comments and very uh, motivating uh, final comment as well. 
Uh, so let me go back if uh, perhaps Imad was able to unmute uh, yourself so that we could receive um, the question. Let me just try to um, see if that was possible. Okay, um, seems like Imad uh, has not been able to unmute. Uh, so let, let us move on to the next uh, question we have received um, from the in the Q&A box. So uh, this one I would like to address uh, is for um, Professor Ishii actually. So uh, who will be the marketing authorization owner um, for CPGD35 and where do you expect to have the first registration? Perhaps uh, DNDI, if you have any additional comments as well, uh, because it's related to both. Yes, I, I think it's a great questions. And I think you, you, Brian, Byron, you should be the one who answer this question because this is so important. I want to list the, know the answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no, very difficult question from Yanis. Uh, uh, and, uh, Yes, no, no, we, this uh, as part of our uh, product development plan, let's say we have of, of course all these uh, concepts in our plan. Uh, no final decision has been taken. We are in continuous discussions regarding the, the marketing authorization owner where we are of course in discussions with uh, different manufacturers. So no one has been identified. Our, of course, our uh, first option since uh, as uh, you know, Moto Gene Design has been accompanying us from the beginning. They, they are on, on top, but this is uh, something, uh, discussion that we have used uh, recently, uh, recently initiated. And of course, uh, as we advance with the clinical development, as we show if the product continues to be moving forward to the phase two, phase three, this, uh, the, these plans need to be uh, more, much more clarified. In fact, uh, and uh, this is something our colleague from the heat can uh, uh, um, testify is that uh, if we plan to continue with enjoying the benefit of uh, the having uh, support from the heat that's some of the questions that we need to clearly state in our next proposal who is going to be the the, the manufacturer of this product regarding the the first registration where we are always looking for the more stringent uh, uh, agencies to, to, to get the approval. Uh, initially, we have discussed, of course, uh, going to EMA, but uh, the, since the product was also initiated by FDA, we can subsequently approach FDA, but uh, those are still uh, plans. And uh, just to mention that uh, uh, yesterday, uh, today, just two, two days ago, we have our advisory committee meeting, and this was one of the ideas that was discussed in that meeting with the uh, with the, this group. Thank you. Over to you. Yes, and uh, if I can add the comment on this uh, Byron's uh, uh, answer, uh, generally, uh, in, in, we, we, you know, Japanese living in this uh, like a developed country wouldn't have any idea to whom uh, that we get you know, you know, this authorization or approval. But uh, you, you know, uh, it is, there are many ways now, uh, not only through WHO, but also with other local uh, regulatory agencies. So uh, my message that from, you know, getting from this uh, Katarin Kalikos who found the uh, messenger RNA vaccine uh, is never give up. So uh, we went through the WHO before, but it didn't work well. But now uh, we are trying to get into the local uh, authorizations or regulatory agencies. And of course, uh, we will not know to which country, which authorization that we will get first. And that is up to you know, uh, BNDI. Sorry, just one last comment. Uh, yes, uh, one of the other options I uh, know that Ken is uh, reminding me is, for example, we discussed about Article 58 in the, in the EU as another option, just to, to mention. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ishii and, and Byron, for, your, for the answers of these questions. Um, so we have been uh, receiving other questions, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I would like to ask the last question from the uh, Q&A box. So this one actually is again uh, addressed to DNDI. 
Um, so let me read the question. Uh, PDPs are not much appreciated, at least at some pharmaceutical companies, which serve as sponsors for clinical trials. How to overcome this hurdle? And at what stage is PDPs encouraged to come in to the development plan? And do PDPs, uh, DNDI, serve as sponsor on clinical trials? So perhaps Anna Katanisan or Byron. Okay, this, this is a difficult answer, but I will try to address. Um, first of all, uh, why we are choosing the, the, our diseases? Huh? I mean, it's, uh, we are tackling unmet needs. So we, are, uh, we have a certain uh, targets of diseases which are not addressed by the, normally the without commercial incentives. So I think uh, for us, uh, we have a clear goal and clear um, uh, diseases, uh, the areas that we work on. So in that sense, uh, that's for, the, for us, it's the first uh, start from there. And then we will find our partners who can uh, collaborate with us. So, and that's how we are gonna work. And uh, maybe Biden will, uh, will have a different view, but that's what I can say. And also um, most of our work, as I said, supported by government of the donors. So I think for us, it's important to um, use that support uh, to contribute to the most neglected patients. So in that sense, uh, we, we see um, pharma uh, friends uh, as also a partner. So we, we, we don't compete, we, we collaborate for our purpose. That's what I can say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nakatani san. Byron? Uh, if I just can add, uh, at least for the, all the NCEs that are in the Lishmania pipeline, I will say that, uh, I can certainly say that uh, these uh, three or four products that are right now within phase one, or, or probably more, uh, we are closely developing in, in collaboration with the pharma companies. So we are not uh, working uh, each one by the side, we are working in close collaboration and, and moving together. I'm not going to mention the names here, but, uh, let me assure you that the four or five NCEs that are currently in phase one, everything is being done in collaboration with these drug companies, pharmaceutical companies. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Byron, for your additional comments. Um, so as much as I would like to, we would like to continue receiving uh, and answering more questions. Unfortunately, we're running out of time and I would like to close the Q&A session. And apologies for I'm mad that we were not able to um, address your question due to perhaps some technical um, issues. So I'll pass back the mic to my colleague, um, Kwemasan. Thank you, itabai -san, and thank you to all the panelists uh, for answer generously answering the questions uh, from the audiences. And uh, thank you all for sending all your questions. And so we are sorry again that we could not um, address all the questions to the panelists. So thank you again uh, for the great discussion to all our panelists today, uh, Dr. Byron Arana and Ms. Kauri Nakatani from the NDI, Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, Professor Ken Ishii from the Institute of Medical Science, University of Tokyo, Ms. Tomomi Kimura from Dean Design, Ajinomoto Biopharma. Thank you so much again to all the panelists. Please allow me to share um, at the end uh, some information uh, before closing this webinar. So uh, we are planning our next webinar, session three of the GPDP's webinar series that will be held on the November 19th from 9 a.m. JST with TV Alliance um, titled Putting Partnership to Work for Better, Faster TV Cure. The registration pages planning to be opened next week. So please visit our website for more information. And uh, there will also be several other upcoming webinars in November, which GHIT co-hosts or sponsors. So please stay tuned. Um, after this webinar, a questionnaire will be sent to you. 
your answers to the questionnaire would really help us to improve our next series of webinars. We also welcome any ideas for potential partnerships or collaborations. So it would be very helpful if you could take two minutes of your time uh, to answer the questionnaire. Um, thank you very much in advance. Thank you very much again for all the time and joining us today to this uh, webinar for multiple regions. And we are looking forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you very much. Have Thank you day. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>